Um, we take up items generally in the order that they're on the agenda. And when we call each item, we ask people to come up to the uh, table here. Um, and we take testimony under oath. Um, and we'll swear people in at each item. There's a sign-up clipboard on the table there if you're interested in getting information or having party status, testifying in a project, we encourage you to sign in on that clipboard at some point during the evening. Um, and when people do testify, the acoustics in here are terrible, so we ask people to really use the microphones there. It really helps us. Um, first item is the agenda, and um, for a variety of reasons, we are swapping two items on the agenda. The first public hearing item, which is 1315 George Street, um, we're going to move that in place of Daniford Road. Um, the reason is we have several people recused on the George Street, and we have one member of the board arriving late, so we want to make sure we have as many board members as possible hearing that item. Um, and the folks from Sanford Road apparently are, are okay with our making that change. Right. Other than that, I think we have no other changes on the agenda? That's correct. Okay. Um, I want to welcome Ravi, our new board member, or alternate. Welcome. Um, and we have communications. We have um, one comment from Public Works on uh, 68 Pearl Street, and we have some minutes in our packet for March 19th and March 6th, which I know Elaine is anxious to have them signed and filed away. Um, so uh, those are the minutes. So the first item uh, on our agenda is uh, under the consent item is uh, 400 Pine Street. Is the applicant here? So this is consent. It's an application to uh, get a time extension on your current project to finish construction of the multi-use building. Obviously, you can see you're well underway on it. So. Yeah, if you've driven past, yeah. Right. Um, and are you okay with the recommendations in the approval recommended by staff? Uh, you know, I did not see anything posted. Um, uh, didn't you get a, you didn't get a letter or email? I got an email with the agenda. I don't think I got an email with the, uh, the recommendations from staff. Mary's going to hand it to you. Great. It's two very short items. While you're looking at that, does anybody on the board object to having this as a consent item? I have one quick question, but we do not need a public hearing. Okay. Um, before we get to your question, is anybody in the public here for 400 Pine Street? No. Do you want to ask your question, Austin? Yeah, I just was, you're looking for an extension, and I couldn't quite tell whether you're looking for, and it, the notes say that you're looking for project completion May, June of 2019? Correct. So are you asking for an extension until June, let's say June 30th, 2019, or do you need more time than that? I don't think I'll need time, though with construction projects, things do happen. Uh, so I would take whatever time, you know, the board would, would allow me. I think uh, July 1 would be a pretty darn uh, uh, reasonable time to have this completed. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so saying all that, um, can we have a motion on this item? Um, yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I would move that we <clears throat> approve the application for the extension of time, adopt staff findings and conditions, um, and just clarify that the extension uh, will be to July 1, 2019. So second on that? AJ, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? I'm not opposed. Great. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. So then our next <laughs> item uh, on our agenda is 251 Staniford Road. It's a public hearing. Thanks for accommodating the agenda. No problem. We're and uh, is there anybody else here for 251 Staniford Road? Just the applicant. Okay. Can I have both your raise your right hand? 
And you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth under pain and penalty of perjury? Yes, yes. sir. Okay. Um, maybe we start by your introducing yourselves and um, sort of. You go ahead. May briefly state we have the packet here with some of the documentation, which you, yes. I think, your your relatives. Right? It's, I'm sorry. Say that is again. It, is it your mother that li lived here? Yes, yes. So it was my grandparents' house. Again, your name is. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> my name is Erica Reddick. Um, I uh, am trying to purchase my grandparents' home. It is currently owned 50% uh, tenants in common by my mother and my aunt. Yes. The home being 251 Stanford. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm John Franco. Um, I am an attorney in Burlington, and I'm representing um, Erica uh, in this matter as her lawyer. Am I supposed to fill this out, too? Um, so basically, you're presenting a case that it has always been a three-unit building. Oh no, not always, but uh, long oh, enough. Well, do you have, do you no, have this? always. It's it's been an, it's been a triplex since it was built. Do you want me to hand these out? I'm hand these out. Um, whether it was used as a triplex is a different question. We have a handout here showing oh. that. Um, well, you want me to do it, John? Uh, pass them around. The handout is a zoning permit that was granted by Ken Lerner um, back in um, August of 1988, where it indicates at that time the use of the property was as a triplex. Um, and attached to that is then the certificate of occupancy granted um, later in August by Ned Holt. Um, and one of our grounds is we think that that actually has a preclusive, a preclusive effect under Section 4472D. Um, because it was for um, changes to what was described as a triplex. And there's a couple of cases on this. Um, there's the uh, uh, Graves versus Town of, uh, uh, town of, town of Waitsfield and also um, Town of Bennington versus Hanson Waldbridge Funeral Home that say in these kinds of circumstances, good, bad, or indifferent, um, it, 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 uh, it has the binding effect of Section 4472D. Um, and, and I would add to the board, this is the third case I have of what I call these long tail triplex conversion cases um, that we seem to, that, uh, seem to keep coming up now by the, enforcement, um, by the enforcement office. This property was constructed in 1964. Uh, if we use this as a benchmark in 1988, that was almost 30, 31 years ago. Um, I have another case which is on appeal to the Supreme Court, the, the Zhang case, which is going to be argued two weeks from today as to whether or not the um, statute of limitations of the uh, applies to both um, the construction and use. That's one of the grounds we've also had. Um, that was the case where the conversion occurred in 1992, which was 25 years ago. And I have another case where the conversion occurred in 1972. And I think it might be... Um, these are, this, I understand the interest in not having a lower medium use um, residential zone be inundated with uh, cutting up of houses and creating multiple units, but these are cases where there are these, these facts have been in the ground for decades. Um, you have a situation here where apparently Erica's grandmother went in and applied and obtained this permit in 1988, and now here we are in 2019, and the family's being told, oh, no, 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 this is illegal and it can't be used this way. Um, so uh, the three grounds are that this has preclusive effect under 4472D. Um, alternatively, that the 15-year statute of limitations applies. But also, we had a belated um, claim that um, it might make sense to treat this as a conditional use um, under the um, non-conforming residential use ordinance um, and essentially recognize what's been the fact now for at least three decades. So if I catch the import of this, is that this point in time sets it as a three-bedroom, a three-unit building in 1988, and... No. It being used as a triplex, it uses the term triplex, yeah. Triplex. And that 4472, that's the exclusivity of remedy, right? Yeah, it's if the... It's not um, appealed in 30 days, right. it's final. Right. So it's, your position is... The city didn't appeal this determination. No one appealed this determination. It's written existing use of property is triplex, and that's that. Right. 
The the case, the oldest case, I think is the, uh, I think it's Graves versus Town of Waitsfield was, um, they applied for a permit for mobile homes in the town of Waitsfield that was granted. It turned out that the zoning administrator allowed two mobile homes when only one was allowed. Supreme Court said it doesn't matter. Um, the other case is, the, this, is, this is one of my favorites, the oldie but goodie, um, the Bennington versus Hanson Walbridge funeral home case, <laughs> which is they claimed that they applied for and got a permit for a, 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 a funeral home. They didn't mention there was a crematorium. The Supreme Court said, wait a minute, you didn't disclose it was a crematorium. You can't be bound by that. And also there's another related case, the Costa Blot case. Um, that's a little different because it had to deal with, it was either a DRB or a ZBA determination, but what it said is, look at if you've been told what the use is going to be and you don't put in conditions saying you can't do certain things, uh, too bad. I call it the speak now, forever hold your peace rule. <laughs> um, and this, let me tell you how old this was. You know who the attorney for the planning department was when this permit was issued? Me. <laughs> John, let me ask you another question, just so I have this right. The triplex was a non-conforming use in ADA, right? I think it's always, well, just way general. back, yeah, I think so. Way back in the before time, there was a provision that in these types of zones, you could get what they call, in, those, in that era, they called it a special, I think a special exemption or special exclusion for an additional unit. Uh, there's no, uh, th th here's the problem. There's no record that we have that that was actually, a, that it was, that was obtained prior to then, but again, the problem with this is that unlike land records, we don't really have a coherent and reliable record of what uh, the permits were, which is one of the problems with these long tail cases. So then you're saying, well, what happened 30 years ago? Is anybody around? Are they still alive? What are the records? Uh, I mean, I had another case, the, the Zhang case. Uh, we actually were able to find the person that made the conversion because for whatever reason, he moved from Florida back to Vermont and back to Colchester, and we were able to locate him. Uh, but this is, this is endemic in these kinds of cases with the problem of trying to establish what happened. But this is, I think this is at least a, if you will, is a benchmark of what was going on. And um, it's at least 30 and a half years ago. So, so I just want to, the city's position, if I ask Scott on this thing, is that it never had legal status as a, three-unit building, triplex? Yes is the short answer. And 1964 would have required a special permit? Yes, special exception. And that, again, it's the use, not the structure. Right. All right we're talking about the use. So do you want me to get into the city's position, or is that just a quick question? Quick question from me. Okay. I think we May I make friend. a comment? Yeah. Uh, to, to further to that point, there's also no original building permit. So if there had been something, assuming there was something submitted for the conditional use, there, the records don't go that far back to begin with. So that's why John picked this one, because we know specifically for sure this is a date that is good. And this, if I'm not mistaken, this was a hockey. Yes. It was a build by house, in other words, hockey built it, and then it was it, built to spec, and then, then her grandparents bought it as a constructed unit. No, they actually purchased it before it was built. Oh, okay, we purchased it before you it was built. You had a question, Austin? Yeah. So, I, you may have already answered at least part of this. So, not, there is not a permit for a triplex when it was built in 1964, nor for anything else. There just, there isn't a permit at all. There's no, there may have been one where there's no record of it. Okay, and that's sort of the second part of my question. Do you, I can't remember, I know the city's had problems or had some conflicting uh, opinions on what permits they need to uh, retain and how long. Do, do you know if permits have been discarded by the city for this period of time or just we don't know one way or other? There's no permit, we don't know why. When I spoke with someone at, I think it was Department of Public Works, she said that there are some plans for that neighborhood, so the Stanford Road, Stanbury kind of area. They have like a dozen building plans or something like that from hockey, but they're on like lot numbers, so you can't tell what the address is, you can't tell anything. Right. And they said that they were gonna ask for clarification, but no one's gotten back to me in the last 
month or two since I had that conversation. Okay, all right. I, I well, can... I'm, I'm equally anxious to um, have the Vermont Supreme Court tell us how to interpret this rule. It's been a problem for a number of people, and we'd like to have some clarity on this. But uh, can I ask you a question, John, about your other can I just point? Say, of... Can I just add to the previous question just sure. a little bit? I had another case involving a property across the street from the old Adams School, and there was an out. It was there was a parking terrace that was put in, and the neighbor complained that that was a pre-existing. It had never got a permit or whatever. And in that case, we were able to track it down to the 1970s because it just so happened that the planning department had an old Polaroid photograph of this in the file, like circa 1977, and we were able to locate. The property had once upon a time been used as a, as a student housing for Champlain College, and we were able to locate the what was then called the dorm mother who lived there. I mean, this is, I'm just trying to explain about, you know, unlike land records, we, when you go back a certain distance. We, we have heard all sorts of horror stories. So I, I, I understand the problem. Again, I'm just trying to, if, uh, again, if there was some permit issued when the house was built, that would be a starting point. In this case, we just don't have it. We just don't know if somebody applied for it and got it and it's been lost or whether there, there was never anything issued. So I get that. Um, the other part, uh, you met, talked about a conditional use for, can you explain your argument there? And my, my basic question is, at this point, what we have before us is an appeal of a finding of um, not approved as a triplex. You're suggesting that we examine whether conditional use for a residential something, and I can't remember the term you used, would be appropriate. Yeah, I, the, 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 it's under Article 5, um, the section is non-conforming residential use. Um, it's on page 5-17 of the current ordinance. And let me explain the logic of, this is something we added later. I think the nature of, of Erica's inquiry was really for all, in all intents and purposes, a request for a declaratory ruling. I think that's really what we're dealing with here. So the thinking was, well, if we're doing that, and since if there's a non-conforming residential use, it's got to be approved by the DRB, we're here. Uh, and it's a kind of a de novo review of what happened before the administrative agency. It would make sense to bring it up now. And that's why we did it. Didn't you say I shouldn't have even asked for a... a a zoning variance, mm, I should ask for something. Yeah, I don't think a variance is the right, I think it's the right church but the wrong pew. A variance is very tough to get in Vermont, impossible. Um, it's really to prevent a regulatory taking, that's the only reason for it. This is really, this is a conditionally permitted um, use, conditional use approval. Uh, it says pursuant to Article 3, Part 5, um, and it's an ex a change or an expansion of a non-conforming residential use. I mean, we clearly have that here. Uh, the, the department doesn't, uh, has argued that this, this section doesn't apply. I, I don't know that I quite understand the navigation through that, but that's also a consideration here. So I'd like to get to uh, the city's position. If anybody on the board has any questions for the applicant at the moment, we'll get back to you too. So oh, okay. give us a second. I think, um, Scott, uh, I think uh, I'll just have you maybe present the city's position. I think one of the, one of the questions I have is there is a, ordinance in here from, and it's not clear where it's from. It's obviously an old ordinance that, that talks. Are from 62. That's from 62. And it does list multi-unit on that page. I don't know if the next page it talks about them being additional use, but it doesn't talk about it on that page being conditional use. Maybe you could explain that too. Um, well, I'll answer that and then get into the okay. position. So if you read above where it talks about multifamily it says, I'm paraphrasing because it's not under my nose, it says the following uses are subject, are approved, are approvable subject to special exception by the You say that in there, mm -hmm. actually. You say any of the following okay, uses. Okay, so number five, any of the following uses, when authorized as a special exception by the Zoning Board of Adjustment, A, apartment houses of three or more family units, hotels, tourist cabins and motels, B and C are irrelevant. That's what I'm referring to. Three or more units, special. Okay. I'm, I'm familiar with that, and I think probably 
current parlance, it would be considered a conditional use. They called it a special right. exception back then. And then I think of, Scott, if I'm not mistaken, then there was another amendment. I call it the anti-hippie amendment. It was about 1970 or 71 that then added a definition, a more exacting definition of what a family was. And then I don't know what the next iteration was when that, which change it might have been in the 80s. Well, 71 was when family definition was tweaked to right. prohibit group quarters. I called it the post-Woodstock Amendment. That's, <laughs> that's not on trial tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Scott. Okay, so uh, this is not an enforcement action. Attorney Franco said something about the enforcement office. Code's not involved in this at all. This was a request for determination to bless the triplex use um, as a pre-existing non-conformity. Sorry, to do the 20 second recap on that, for something to be a legit pre-existing non-conformity, it needed to be okay when it started. So the house was built in 64 the 62 zoning code said single family duplexes are okay in this area. Three or more homes needed a special exception from the ZBA. So um, administrative zoning permits um, pre early 1970s are not in our files. We're looking for them. We have zoning board of adjustment decisions back to the 40s. And you'll see even for this property, we have a ZBA decision from 1968 for a real estate office. I assume it was a home occupation, but there's not much in the way of detail. Anyways, the point is we have ZBA decisions back to the 40s, including one for 68 for this property. So 62 said you needed ZBA decision approving it. House was built in 64. There is nothing anywhere in the file or in the permit log that was in use in the time that said anything about a triplex use. Um, that's really the punchline. And most of the city records point to two units, which is a little bit curious if it always had three units. Um, there are some records like Vermont Gas and the affidavits which point to three. But I think the punchline really is there's no ZBA decision approving this. So, so then we're looking at the statute of limitations. You know on the, the drill on that. Um, Attorney Franco correctly points out the 204 North Avenue Jang case of the Supreme Court. And depending how that goes, that could have significant implication for this case. On the use, well, the use, yes, can for the be use violation. In. Yep. And so, so your position is that the, um, no matter how it's been used in, in intervening years, um, the fact that it never had a legitimate use and it's a use violation. Right. Grandfathered is predicated on being legit when it began. Except that we claim that that changes with this. But, uh, yes, thank you for reminding me, Attorney Franco. So, in your packet tonight, you have a zoning permit from 2017. The application form refers to existing and proposed use as two units. So then you say it's reversed by the 2017 application. I, I don't think his assertion that the triplex from 88 is legit, but... If you were, are willing to entertain that, we have the permit from 2017 referring to two. A permit in 2017 to do what? That calls it a two. That refers to two units as existing and proposed use. That being said, that was submitted by my aunt, who was not <laughs> very well, um, yeah. didn't pay super great attention to things. <laughs> sure. I, we have a variety of permits and records in front of us that talk about two units and three units. And sometimes it's just a single family house when things are being applied. So it is confusing. Um, yeah. And this, this permit really, it approves um, screening in an existing porch. It doesn't, it's not a change of use. It's, it's hard to say the city well, was reviewing and approving the, 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 the pre-existing use really wasn't critical to this decision. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but if I, I can throw the, you know, zoning is in derogation of common law property rights and it's supposed to be construed strictly against the city and liberally in favor of the property owner and throw Hanson Walbridge and the other Graves case back at you. I mean, that's, that's I understand what the legal argument is. Um, you know, how that would, I, I, I could argue your side of it too. And just, I don't, I don't know if it matters or not, but as Scott mentioned, this wasn't a violation. Um, well, I mean, it was, but <laughs> like we didn't get caught, you know. Um, we've been 
with code enforcement forever. We've never had any violations. Code enforcement has it as a three unit property. Um, we've always paid all of our bills on time and everything. So there was no like, this would not have come up if I hadn't gone to get a mortgage for the property. And then, you know, the appraiser was like, it's a three unit. And the city was like, no, it's a two unit. And they were like, sorry, sucker, you can't get a mortgage now. So that's how we've gotten here. You're not, I mean, that's a spot where a lot of people get caught at that point. I mean, <laughs> not, not real caught. Real world consequence. Yes. Caught point. up. <laughs> caught up. Yes. Yes. Um, at that moment, you know, people try to resolve that. And usually it's the same kind of issue that it's got more value as a triplex than it does a duplex, I suspect. And oh, that's part, a considerable part, part difference. Part of the issue. Uh, in fact, it is to the, it is such a considerable difference that if, I have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to convert it to a duplex, it will no longer be feasible for my family to keep the home. Well, the, you know, whether you can use it, I would talk to Mr. Franco about this, as to whether or not you can use it as a triplex or actually have to do any structural conversions. I have, I'm, I'm sorry, can you say that into the microphone so I can hear you better? I think, I think again, we're into this realm of structure versus use. Uh, I, so. I, I know that this, about this I know that the environmental division has taken that position since Judge Wright first articulated it 20 years ago. Gonna keep close to the microphone. I, I said I know that I know that the, the environmental division has sustained that reasoning for the last 20 years. Um, to me, it makes absolutely no sense. Why would you build a deck if you can't use it? Why would you build a third apartment if you can't use it? And um, what we will be arguing to the Supreme Court is Occam's razor, the simplest explanation tends to be the correct one, <laughs> and that the statute of limitations applies to both uses and to uh, structures. And Otherwise, it makes no sense. And I've also asked, like, is there some way that we can, you know, change this, fix this? Like, can I just call Patrick my roommate so that, like, you know, not to be d dishonest or anything, but, like, what can we do to just not make it so that my family can't keep the home that my grandparents purchased 60 years ago for our family. So, and what I was told was that the renovations had to be significant enough so that it could not then be converted back into a separate apartment, which is reasonable. I don't even, like, I can't even argue about it, but. So Scott, from the city's point of view, um, whether this has been in continuous use as a triplex or not is not a factor. Is that it's, correct? It's irrelevant. It was built in 64. 62 is the cutoff for special exception. So it should have had a, a ZBA mm -hmm. permit. And but again. Um, if, if I may yeah. briefly just about making it legit, maybe you were referring to Attorney Franco's comment or not. Anyways, I'll, I'll address it. So there's, in the appeal documents, request for consideration under the nonconformity conditional use. So I'll say two things there. One is if they want to pursue that, right, they would have to file a conditional use application. Um, more significantly, and this might be confusing explanation because it's confusing, that provision is in there to enable otherwise non-conforming residential uses that are approved through adaptive reuse and residential conversion. So in other words, if you're in the residential low density zone and you have a commercial structure, right, and you do the residential conversion, right, you're not limited to just a single family or a duplex, right? That provision is there to incentivize conversion or adaptive reuse, as may be the case, by increasing the allowable density, right? So, so that's basically so there to your allow your resultant triplex or quadplex or so whatever the argument it was. Is that's not here because you're not doing an adaptive reuse. Correct. So we, th and we use that for North Avenue, right? The multi-family was an adaptive reuse, therefore there was sort of a density bonus for conversion to residential. Okay. Right. Which North Avenue? The, the one on... Uh, I'm trying Packard to loss. avoid calling it the, the mayor's project. Uh, yes, that was <laughs> right. I, I will know. I mean, we have other projects in the same kind of category as this where I don't think anybody tried to get away with anything. I think it just happened over the years that now because of the mortgage thing, you're 
you find yourself caught in a, in a non-complying situation, at least from the city's point of view. And I think the board has traditionally had a lot of sympathy for that, and it's, but it's a struggle as we feel bound to, that we have to do something that fits with the zoning regulations and trying to find some solution that works with that um, is the challenge. Um, and I, Attorney Franco, um, if, if this 1988 was final, but as Scott says, there's something in 94 or some a subsequent one that talks about it being a, a duplex again. Um, so we're sort of we would we would have I mean if this was a trial we bring in a number of people that say that that representation of 2017 is just incorrect. It's been a been a triplex for 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 decades. And included in our package is the is affidavits from the folks who literally yes. watched the house get built. And I had asked if I should. There are more people in the neighborhood that I've met that remember my grandparents. They were friends with my mom and my aunt and my uncle and whomever. And they all said that they were happy to provide affidavits as well. And I was told that it wasn't that we had two and that they probably might not matter anyway. <laughs> so, but like it's. I mean, the neighbors have known like, that it's a triplex. I see their testimony in, in here. They're quite clear about that. And, and we're, we're Scott. Not Nobody's contesting any of the facts. It's just how you apply those facts to the, the requirements of the ordinance. I mean, Understood. even if you accept that as 100% true, we still have uh, well, legal well, issues that we need to get past. I understand that. Yeah. Well, we don't know, Scott, if I'm understanding this right, is it sort of, by there not being a ZBA l permit on file, um, we don't really know what was actually applied for in 1963 or four. We only know that right. that, yeah, that does not exist in the file, sort of a negative kind of thing. That permit does not exist in there, but there's no record of actually what was applied for. Right, well, it would make sense that a single family or duplex would have gotten an admin permit. And again, in the 60s, we don't know where they are, if they're anywhere, but we do know where the ZBA decisions are because we have them. And, yeah, I'm, I guess one makes the assumption that if it needed a particular permit, it would have gotten that particular permit. Not like what we see sometimes where, just as an example, we've seen before the coordination between public works and, and planning and zoning, where permits were issued by public works for a, a project that was not approved by zoning, a, a two-unit building or three-unit building where the zoning permit wouldn't have allowed it. Mm -hmm. And that people have building permits for those kind of things. And, and once upon a time, the zoning, and zoning ordinances were administered by the building inspector in the city of Burlington way back in ancient times, the 40s, ancient 50s, time. and 60s. I think right. Ray Wheel, maybe, was the, zoning, was the building inspector. I mean, so you've got a whole, and what's really brought, what really brought out this problem of the history of, of permits was when they had the Bianchi decision that made the lack of permits a... a, 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 a uh, stain on the title, and it was every all the. I don't do real estate law, but the real estate practitioners were pulling their hair out because they said, "Look, it, we don't have a recording system like we have for deeds, and that kind of thing for the permits, and that really created a mess." And I would just say, in my opinion, that <clears throat> it's hard to say that it's a complete file of all of the permits if you don't have the actual building permit. I don't know how you can say that you have everything when you don't have everything. <laughs> and the, the record of buildings, which is old, also even shows that the second floor is separated into a two bedroom and a two, uh, two room. So it's unfortunate that people were not diligent about crossing all of their T's and dotting all of their I's. Yes. Um, just, I th think we've got... I was going to leave you with one last thought. Oh. <laughs> Make it a good one. This house was built when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> just to put it in perspective. Any other questions? <laughs> Any other questions for the board? Thank you. And I, nobody's here for this, I believe. Okay. Thank you. We're going to... Thank you very much. Maybe deliberate at the end of the day. We'll see. Um, I, I have a question for... Staff? the board and staff. 
There was an instance where we did hear affidavits recently. I can't remember what. Yes, I was on something where, where they said. Remind me why that worked. Because it was, for, we were trying to establish. Use. I'm sorry, can you guys speak into your microphones? Yeah. I think on that case, if I remember correctly, we were trying to establish continuous use, and that was the only thing that they needed to. Yeah. Statue of limitation. No, non, not. Uh, we were, as Zoroy said, as Zoroy said, what we were trying to establish was that it was continuously not, used. yeah, continuously. Okay. Used. And the affidavits presented okay. it that way. It was always there. Yep. Okay. okay. I did Thanks. not hear half of what you guys said. So, what in, a you in a prior project, before the board, um, it was a similar issue, but not identical. The question was, had a non-conforming use ever been abandoned for longer than a year? A year. I was trying to remember whether we're doing the six months or a year rule, but this one was a year. Right. The building and was abandoned? The use. It's a different part. So <laughs> okay. And so we had to take affidavits from people who said, no, nah, it was always used as such. Okay. <clears throat> and that is not helpful in this case? It's totally not applicable. It was really, it was a <laughs> yeah. factual issue, and I, as I... As we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. if we accept your facts 100%, we still have some problems. Got it. Okay. And I just wanted to make sure we talked about that in the public hearing, so it's on record. Got it. And yeah, and so then, we, then yes, our affidavit does show that it's been in continuous use since it was built, according to the affidavit. Okay. Thank you for asking that. Crosses one problem. All right. Okay. So, Thank you. Um, now the next item on the agenda is 1315 George Street. Uh, I thought I did close it actually before. Oh. We're officially closing that public hearing. Thank you. Will we be deliberating tonight, you think, on this one or not? It depends how long the next one. Are you refused on the next one? No. We I am. We are. We are. And uh, if we want to stick around, we could maybe deliberate on this later. Okay. We'll stick around. All right. That's all right. And two of us are recused, or three of us. I thought I saw Jeff come in, too. Yeah, All Jeff right. has left. So um, Jim stepped out for a minute. I think it makes sense to wait for him to join. Uh, OK, well, why don't I just call it? And yeah. But we won't take any testimony until he's here. All right. Yep. So um, the next item, um, and again, just for the record, Brad, AJ, and Jeff are all recusing themselves, so I will be serving as uh, the chair for this application. Um, this is 19-0533CA uh, slash MA, 19-0532CA slash CU, 19-0534CA slash MA, 19-0535CA, and 19-0536CA. 13 to 15, 19 George Street, 68, 80, 90, and 70 Pearl Street. So the applicant is here. Is there anyone else in the audience tonight who thinks they might wish to make comments or ask questions about this application? All right. Can you all raise your right hand so I can swear you in? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth under pain and penalty of perjury? I do. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, I'll may pass. I, may I give a preamble before you, before they do their presentation? Sure. Do you want to wait for Jim to return? It, I think it would be good to have as many board members participate as we can. So that's a yes, you're going to wait for Jim to return? At your choice. Let's wait for Jim to return, though. So. Just for those of you who have not been here before, um, will the applicant uh, will present the application. Um, board members can then ask questions of the applicant, and then we'll give an opportunity for members of the public to ask their questions, make their comments. Uh, so that will come. Okay. Mary. I, I wanted to give just a short preamble before the board hears this case, because it's um, relatively unusual. Um, part of this application is being reviewed under the standard articles of the ordinance, and that's the residential portion. We have two zoning districts and two sets of regulations. 
if you were reading your supporting material online and you opened up the folder for the project narrative, it was followed by a great deal of information, a lot of checklists. None of those are for you. That is the staff portion of the review. So for the Article 14 section for the form districts relative to the Pearl Street properties, your review is limited to the request for extra height. And that's in your findings or in your uh, staff report, Article 14 on page 22. That is the limit of your review, is the extra height. The remainder of the staff report is relative to the residential portion, which is in the high density residential zone, and those are the George Street properties. So if you have any questions about what you're looking at or what your review is, I'm happy to help you with that. Well, Mary, thank you. The, and I get the distinction. There were a couple of areas where it was very hard to look at this as two separate projects with two sets of rules. One was traffic, because I get it, we have traffic generated by the senior housing, but it's impossible to, which is I think probably relatively minor compared mm -hmm. to the traffic generated by the, the hotel and cafe and also parking are interrelated. So I think we'll need some assistance on figuring out how to apply those cri two criteria given the two projects in two different zones with different standards. That was my you, reaction. You do anyway. bring up a good point. I have provided you with the most recent parking and traffic study from the applicants, but this afternoon DPW provided their analysis, which is before you. Okay. So that's in your um, communications packet. Okay, right. So I'll turn it over to the applicant. If you could identify yourself and then yeah. what, do we, what do you want to tell us? Well, uh, it's been a long time. I think the last time you saw us was in 2016 when the sketch plan, so we've come a long way since then. I'm John Alden with Scott and Partners Architects and I've got Rick Bull with me here. And I've got uh, a lot of consultants that are waiting to answer all of your detailed questions. <laughs> so I know, well, there's a lot of parts and pieces to this and you're right to point that out. So we've, we do have a hotel building, we do have an apartment building and we do have a parking, uh, you know, approach with an underground piece and a surface piece. And it all, it does all relate together. It's, it's one big project and we're just going to walk you through a short slideshow. I might have uh, some of our uh, panels here uh, explain the details of some of them, but I'm trying to keep it brief because I'm sure you have already read it and you have questions. So um, let's see what happens here. Uh, so this is from an older slideshow because you've seen it before, but I just wanted everyone to remember where we are on the city map. Um, so we're in the box here. That's the existing uh, Victoria Place. Um, and then because zoning's changed since the last time we were here, we now have uh, the red line indicating the difference between the uh, RH zone and the, what is now the uh, Form District 5. And there's also an overlay E for height. OK, so um, it, part of the project the apartment building is actually over here in the RH section, and the hotel um, is over here in, in the uh, FD5 section. All right, so here's the existing site plan. Um, you can see the buildings that are in place now include uh, two um, former single family homes, now apartment buildings along George Street, uh, these two lots here. This is the standard house, which was recently rehabbed uh, quite nicely by uh, Rick. Uh, Victoria Place, the um, former Bob's Restaurant, uh, Social Security, and the large parking lot that exists now. Uh, 48 spaces, surface parking, 18 belong to Victoria Place in the standard house, and the remaining 30 are metered by the city. Those 30 spaces are being, there's a purchase and sale agreement with Rick for him to take over all the parking. So that entire lot comes uh, to be part of this project application. 
and there's a deal between the city and Rick that 30 spaces will remain available for public use during the day. Not necessarily metered by the city, but however Rick wants to do it, he still has an obligation to uh, retain access to 30 spaces so that people, anybody could use them. And we, we'll get into that later. It's, it's part of the parking issue. Um, the proposed site plan, I'm going to have uh, O'Leary and Burke help me with this one, but uh, there's a lot of uh, material going on here with regard to underground things. This is the surface plan. Um, this is the ramp down into the garage from George Street. This is the apartment building. This is uh, the hotel with the restaurant, or well, it's a commercial space on the first floor fronting onto Pearl. This is the existing driveway that's been redeveloped as a more of a shared use. Uh, you've got pedestrian, you've got uh, cars, and we'll show you how that works later on in the slideshow. And uh, this other little piece here is just the stair uh, coming down from the wing of the hotel, which uh, you might be able to pick out. There's a, a, or a yellow line here, which outlines the upper level of the hotel starting on level two. It is over the parking lot. Um, you guys want to do the fine points on, <coughs> on maybe the underground structures and so forth? Please. Uh, so, Brian Courier, O'Leary Burke Civil Associates. Uh, so, John started. Oh. Okay, there you go. Uh, so, the utilities for the George Street loft building uh, will come off George Street. We are doing a uh, slightly uh, um, water line replacement along the road. Uh, it's an uh, old six-inch clay line corroded, uh, so we're going to be replacing a section of that with eight-inch PVC, uh, adding a hydrant at the end, sewer comes off the existing sewer service along George Street. Uh, he mentioned the ramp going down to the underground parking. Um, the hotel is going to be served by the existing utilities on Pearl Street. Um, water, sewer, um, just upgrading the existing services uh, for the um, restaurant. Um, the stormwater system has been reviewed by the Conservation Committee and the City Stormwater Department. Um, it's inclusive of an uh, underground uh, storm tech system, uh, promotes infiltration and overflows to the uh, combined water sewer uh, on Pearl Street. Um, that's, that's it. <coughs> Hi, Jeremy Owens, landscape architect, TJ Boyle Associates. Um, let's see here. I think that one of these buttons will. Oh. Uh, Ended up with black. There we go. So here's the landscape plan. Essentially, the landscape uh, is based on three major components. You have um, a, a redo of the uh, existing drive aisle. You have um, some outdoor space for the apartments, and then you have some periphery uh, landscape. Um, the, the first major component is we basically have a 24-foot wide drive aisle with five feet of sidewalk and roughly five or six feet of sidewalk on this side. And what we're trying to do, because we have a, um, a hotel entrance in the back here is we're trying to convert this to a little bit more uh, pedestrian style entrance to be more inviting and, and make it more of a shared space rather than um, essentially mostly a drive lane. So we've reduced that drive lane to 18 feet and we've essentially got five feet of walking space, uh, an additional five feet of either planting islands and uh, temporary pull off for um, either unloading or, un or loading of vehicles or uh, pedestrian drop off. Um, 18 feet of dedicated drive lane and then we're retaining the existing sidewalk along the side of the Victoria Place building. Um, the other additions are uh, materials. We've added some um, 
paving surface, uh, I'm sorry, concrete paver surfaces. We haven't exactly picked out the colors yet, but the idea is that the pedestrian use will take precedent over <coughs> the driving use. And so most of this is going to read on a more pedestrian scale rather than asphalt roadway. Um, bike parking out front, as well as some um, seating for the commercial space off to the side. Um, the next major component is the outdoor space for the lofts building. Uh, you can't really hide the fact that it's a parking lot and underneath we do have parking as well. So this area here is actually on the, the concrete deck above. And so instead of having to come out of your lofts building into essentially a parking lot, um, we've decided to take advantage of getting additional um, green space um, credit that we need in order to, to have this used in the first place and convert this into a, a more of a garden type outdoor space. Um, we have your main connection for pedestrian, um, wooden seating, uh, wooden deck with seating on top uh, for picnic tables, um, and then an outdoor gardening space and a small shed, uh, some additional gardening space and a little bit of bike storage. So that's the second major component. And then the third is the periphery. Um, essentially, we've got um, landscape plants along the very thin strip over next to the Social Security office to, um, we're using very thin, small diameter trees to get some vertical relief onto the building as well as a little bit more of a green buffer. Um, along the back edge, we have a six foot tall uh, fence to uh, maintain some privacy between the residential uses to the north and the parking space. Um, uh, by privacy, I mean some screening and for headlights and um, essentially visibility into the site. Um, and similarly over here, we've softened the building on the north side and, and maintained some privacy here for not only for the residents to the north, but also for the new residents inside the residential building. Um, so that pretty much wraps it up. Um, John, you want the pointer back? Um, okay, so I'm just going to walk you through a couple of the floor plans. Just uh, I'm trying not to spend a lot of time on them because I know you've already seen them. Uh, but just so we all remember, um, we're, this is our entry ramp. This is the lower level. It's, it's only the rectangle you see here. This is the footprint of the hotel above and the um, garage entry level for the um, lofts building uh, has, uh, you know, tenant storage, bike parking, those kinds of things inside. Um, back to the full uh, surface level, this is, uh, you know, the uh, lofts that we just saw. Here's the hotel over here. Uh, there's the stair coming down. These are all the surface spaces that are underneath, and I'm going to quickly go to the second floor, so now that you can see the um, wing of the hotel as it covers the part of the parking. Um, all the spaces behind Victoria Place remain, so those, we'll see those later. That's part of uh, the, the spaces that will serve the ongoing business and commercial uses at Victoria Place. Um, this is the fifth floor, which, um, I don't know where Tyler go. Uh, it's, it's actually a little smaller than the floors below. You can see we have mechanical space here. Um, we have a narrow, little bit narrower wing on that end. Uh, we're forced to step back from the residential district on the, to the north, so that's what's driving the shape of this. And now I'm going to let Tyler do the elevations. Um, you've seen the materials in your packets. So, uh, yes, yeah, Tyler Scott, Scott and Partners. And uh, could you just try to speak into the microphone? You sure. could pull it around if you want to. Just it, that would be better anyway. There we go. So the uh, the top elevation faces west. And uh, this is a uh, stairwell here, and this is uh, some of the landscaping that uh, was described previously. Um, this uh, level down here is a dark, uh, somewhat glazed brick. It's not a glossy brick, but it's meant to reference the original uh, sort of Art Deco base of Bove's uh, restaurant. Um, 
Up above that is a, is a more of a beige brick here. And then above that is a reddish brick. Um, this material here is a metal shingle um, that is sort of an overlapping, installed in sort of an overlapping manner. And then above here uh, is some mechanical screening. We're not actually sure how large that will need to be. So we're still working on that end of it. But that's just uh, mechanical screening that would be a similar tone as the gray down here. Um, out here, there is this fifth floor steps back on the, on the south side here, and there's a canopy over that, the deck here, and then it also steps back here. What this is, is mechanical screening on the fourth, on the fifth floor, so that the residents on the, on the north side won't see that. Um, and then down here, we have a canopy on the, on the south side as an entrance to the and see down below here to the restaurant. So on the uh, east side, uh, again, similar materials as I just described. This is just a dining area upstairs also. Um, and then this portion right here actually steps towards you in the picture. Uh, that would be towards the east. Um, so in its, uh, in its effect, this is the, again, the metal shingle material here. This is cement board panel here. And uh, so that's it. It's about 10 foot eight. Uh, it's about 14 feet from floor to floor on the lower floor, 10 foot eight on up from there, and then just a little bit higher uh, to accommodate the roof construction and insulation from there. So I think it comes out to about 58 feet, somewhere in there. So anyway, that's the description at this point. Is there another? Ah, well, there you go. So the. Uh, Pearl Street facade is uh, this narrow facade here. Um, it's about 37 feet wide. And uh, we've, again, incorporated sort of a the general appearance uh, of an Art Deco look here with the brickwork, which was one of the requests of the city uh, planning department. And uh, so that's... Uh, the general uh, goal here, uh, a lot of glass down at this level for most likely a restaurant at this point. Um, then rooms up above here. And then uh, again, the top room that's uh, set back, that top suite. Uh, on this uh, south side here, uh, some of it would be hidden behind Victoria Place, roughly from this line over uh, would be hidden pretty much by Victoria Place in the sense from Pearl Street. Uh, but we've taken this mass and broken it up with a series of panels that uh, align with the stairwell here. Um, and then on the, on the north side, we've switched around to a, a cement board panel here and some brick yet here. Uh, down below here, as you see, is parking down below in this area. Uh, this is a mechanical space here, so parking is down here. What you see here is the fence in the distance on the very north side of the boundary uh, property. So that's it in a nutshell. All right. Um, so uh, we have an overall Pearl Street elevation uh, on the top. Uh, with the new hotel um, peeking out uh, existing Victoria Place standard house and you can see the forms of the proposed new uh, buildings behind that. Um, and then on the bottom is just the site section showing uh, the entry down into the garage from uh, George Street and now you can see the um, side view of George Street lofts and, and uh, cut through the hotel. Um, so, uh, shared use, and again, uh, Jeremy spoke very well about this. Um, this is the, the current location of the drive back into the parking area, but um, under our uh, redesign, uh, we're really trying to make it into more of a, a pedestrian plaza and something that would be inviting to, um, you know, get people back to the hotel entry. So um, discussions with DPW uh, a while ago suggested they would allow us to play with um, all the pavement, uh, paved surfaces and other sidewalk surfaces out there. So we took advantage of that and have 
actually um, shown pavers uh, from the uh, west side all the way over to uh, Victoria Place. So um, we like that ability to play with that. We think it helps with the whole pedestrian experience and it certainly helps with uh, our entry sequence. And just a close up, um, there's one of the planters that Jeremy described. We envisioned some type of uh, signage here identifying the place and providing some direction back to the hotel entry. Um, you can see the bollards, you can see the way that the uh, undulating pattern of the pavers will create some intrigue there and also provide space for cars to pull off and, uh, while, while they're waiting. Um, all right, so we're on to George Street lofts now and I'm gonna turn this over to Joel again for that. Hi, I'm Joel Page with Scott and Partners. Uh, George Street Lofts is a four-story building with a full basement underneath. The basement will have uh, utilities and bike storage and other uh, accessories, as John had mentioned. Um, the exterior facade of the building is really clad in durable materials. Um, the main George Street elevation, check and figure out how to use this thing. Show me how to use this thing. There it is. Um, this is the George Street elevation. Uh, the building, uh, if you look on the adjacent elevation, sets back. So the main facade along George Street is a mix of brick and uh, metal shingle panels, which are similar to the ones being installed in the hotel. And then further back uh, is all metal panel siding. Um, the idea is to, there were some comments from the design advisory board about trying to scale the building in some way so that we could sort of create a transition onto George Street and we tried to do that because we couldn't really change the physical side of the building too much to do that with materials. So the idea would be when you'll see them in perspectives is the, uh, the line of brick and the little parapet cap that goes along it is actually of a similar scale to the buildings along George Street and then the metal clad upper story sort of kind of disappears in the background and then there it's capped with some smaller um, fascias. Along the side of the building, I believe this is Could you, the... I'm sorry, just bring the microphone bring a little closer. A little closer. You, the ends of sentences are getting lost a little okay. bit. Uh, on this side of the building, this is the north elevation, uh, the side of the apartments. Um, there's an exit out the back end. Um, the building uh, along George Street, again, the, the brick turns the corner. So when you're looking at it in perspective, the primary elevations you'll see are the corners of this uh, protrusion of the front of the building. Um, the build, we've broken up the scale of the back portion of the building with multiple uh, levels of metal panels um, with different faces and different contours to help give it a feeling of, of, of order. Um, the, the windows for the building itself are designed in a similar pattern to what you see along George Street, a more residential pattern of, 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 of popped openings. Um, as you make your way, whoop, hit the wrong button again. Around to the back of the building. Uh, this is the side that probably no one will see except somebody in the hotel, metal clad siding. And then on the George Street, or the Pearl Street side of the building, this is where the, you enter into the parking garage, uh, and then we have metal panels. And then again, that bricked corner facade as you turn uh, and you're looking up onto George Street. The building itself will be built super, uh, will high energy efficiency. We're trying to meet the efficiency of Vermont's high performance requirements. Uh, it'll be used, the major tenants will be elderly and um, mix of access within the building of stairs and an elevator. Um, the roof will be 
basically low pitched uh, with internal drains so we can manage the stormwater coming off the building. There'll be a few protrusions off the top, which would be the elevator, and then some sort of a screening uh, for the uh, rooftop um, ductless mini split units. I think it's all me now. Um, all right, so uh, the rest of the, the show is mostly, um, I'll say, the pretty picture part, right? So we've got uh, streetscape uh, shown here. Some of these you've seen in your packet. Uh, we've got the view from George Street looking down, uh, looking up George Street to the north, and then the whole, um, really the site elevation along uh, George Street. So you can see what Joel was talking about with the uh, roof lines and the various components. I mean, we spend a lot of time uh, trying to get, uh, you know, a, a more dense apartment building to look like it meant to match the other smaller buildings to the north on the street. So the materials, the rhythm, the windows, all are designed to be uh, sympathetic to the, the neighborhood to the north. Um, and then we, uh, I think you've seen some of these before, but, uh, you know, we've got the sky uh, put in and some other features um, from the rendering, so we'll just take you on a spin around the block here. Uh, this is the other um, housing unit. We didn't get all the windows put in, but that's the uh, neighboring building just to the west. Um, again, uh, corner of uh, Pearl and George and uh, straight on of, uh, at the apartment building, uh, looking back uh, south along George. And um, I think you have these in your package as well, but it's a, sort of the overall site. You can see uh, really how it, it does a nice job building up the density in the whole uh, corner there as you approach Pearl Street in the downtown core. And uh, we put this one in because it's really hard to kind of understand all the parts and pieces that are happening on the hotel building um, in three dimensions from the elevation. So hopefully that helped people understand uh, what happens there. So um, this is our, what we're hoping for. We're hoping to get going fairly soon. Uh, you know, as, as soon as this summer, we've got a construction manager on board. We've got Rick ready to get going as soon as he gets through the process here, and uh, we uh, hope to be pretty much open in 2020. So um, I'll leave the slideshow at that. I'll talk about anything you want. I'll talk about any of the staff comments. Uh, we thought the staff uh, report was very extensive and uh, right on the money with, with what we were trying to do. Um, we don't really have any trouble with most of the conditions, although um, DPW's uh, uh, traffic and parking comments are a little concerning. We just got those today. And uh, Roger Dickinson is here um, as our traffic engineer, and he and I will handle any and all of those comments today. So where would you like to start? Um, well, I'll Again, other members have, may have questions, but I think, as I said earlier, uh, a summary of the traffic study okay. would be helpful. Again, we have DPW's comments, but like you, we just got those. I have not had a chance to review those. I don't know, is somebody from DPW here today? To, okay, all right. Um, and then, again, there's, Good materials on your parking plan, but it's dense, it's long. If you could just give me a summary of how this works for parking and justification of the parking waiver, those were those would be the two things I would identify. Okay. Um, when we get to the really technical part, I'll have uh, Roger come up and join me, but um, let me tackle the first part. So. Um, in general, the parking plan outlines uh, how we're orchestrating the use of the 88 uh, physical spaces. I will point out that with the bonus for underground parking, we have 128, um, 124 spaces on paper uh, to satisfy the zoning demand of 100 and, um, 
uh, eight. So on, on paper, we were fine, uh, including the waiver. Um, now the waiver we're asking for is a 50% waiver of the loft building only. So uh, because that's in the RH zone, it generates two parking spots per unit at 20 units that would normally be 40 spaces. Um, we're asking for a 50% waiver based on uh, the fact that they're uh, predominantly, as in 18 out of 20 units, are single bedroom units for seniors. And so uh, based on Rick's experience with similar housing stock, uh, he finds that the ratio for people actually having cars um, is less than one per unit. So uh, we're fully expecting there to be something like 12 to 15 cars uh, physically on site because of the 20 units. Uh, although we, we are um, only looking for uh, a direct one-to-one, -one, one space per one unit uh, ratio of parking. So we're asking for 20, a 20 space waiver, which would leave us 20 spaces for the 20 units. Two <clears throat> points. One is there's a sort of a backup plan of tandem parking if there's the need for it. Can you walk us through where yes. that is and how that works? And secondly, there's an agreement with the city that 30 of the spaces yep. are going to be available for public parking, I think, during the day. Yep. So how does that work into your parking so, calculations? Um, there are 39 surface spaces. We are saying nine of those spaces, and we're, we're assuming they're the ones along the back of Victoria Place, will be um, left available for Victoria Place customers. We're saying the other 30 spaces on the surface will be available for day use by anyone, which is what the city uh, requested. And it will be the hotel management's job to figure out that if they have to actually move cars, because it'll be valet parking, uh, they'll have to move them. And what we find from our uh, traffic analysis and, and our parking analysis, however, is that from the hours of uh, 9 in the morning till about 7 at night, there, there are uh, less vehicles generated by the hotel use, um, then uh, we need to provide the 30 spaces. And the overlap is uh, where we're two spaces short is between 8 and 9 a.m. So between 8 and 9 a.m., according to the shared parking analysis, we'd only have 28 spaces that were free. And so we're uh, saying that it will be, again, back to the valet system to you know, make sure that those two cars are uh, either tandem parked down at the lower level or uh, maybe the case never actually happens. So, uh, or maybe we take advantage of spaces that aren't being used by the seniors. So um, there's a lot of active management required, but the hotel commitment is to manage those vehicles so that the, there'll be 30 spaces um, available during the day for the city agreement. <coughs> Okay, and so how the 30 spaces that sort of disappear during the day for use by the hotel, how does, have you included those 30 spaces in your, again, the numbers of required spaces for the hotel cafe use? Just, is there some sort of a shared use analysis? Is that how you account for those? There is. Uh, that's the, um, the basis of what Roger uh, has put together for everybody. And, and I think if you, um, I don't know if you saw, and I may have uh, Roger explain this, but um, uh, do you, did you see this page in the traffic analysis? And would you know how to interpret it? Because it's, it's dense, right? There's a lot going on. Roger, do you want to walk everybody okay. through that? Good evening, I'm Roger Dickinson of Lamoureux and Dickinson Engineers. And uh, so we performed a shared parking analysis uh, using uh, data from uh, the Urban Land Institute shared parking publication. 
as well as uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers and the city ordinances. And basically we have, uh, from those uh, sources uh, and publications, we have hourly ratios. We know that the residential, uh, for example, you know, the parking demand peaks in, in the evening, and then as people uh, go to workshop or wherever, uh, doctor's appointments, things like that, uh, those spaces are vacated during the day. Same for the hotel. Uh, hotel peaks at night, uh, guests leave during the day, and gradually in the afternoon, you know, uh, new guests come in, check in for the, for the next evening. And so this is all factored into the shared parking analysis. And the spaces are essentially available on a first come, first serve basis. Uh, there's no you know, block of spaces, uh, for example, that are reserved exclusively for uh, George Street lofts, uh, for example, or Victoria Place. It's, it's all first come, first served. Uh, <clears throat> That's in the analysis. We, we fully expect to allocate spaces to the residents of the loft so they know where their spaces are. Again, it's the hotel will have to manage around that when they valet the cars. Are, are the public spaces, the 30 parking public spaces, are they metered? Are they free? How? We're pretty sure they're metered. Now, the, the, my understanding of the agreement with, uh, language in the, uh, the city uh, agreement is that uh, maybe they're metered, maybe there's a monthly arrangement, maybe there's any number of ways to pay for those spaces if you use them, but they need to be available during the day at 30. Go ahead. So the, uh, <coughs> in the parking and, and in the traffic analyses, we uh, have, have included uh, the fact that uh, uh, cars will, you know, hotel guests will, will arrive at the site, check in, their cars will either be, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, moved by valet service uh, to the lower parking lot, or the guests themselves will, will uh, move their vehicles to the uh, 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 location where the management uh, directs them to park. Uh, we've accounted for the extra trips in the traffic analyses, people having to go around the block uh, valets will have to, uh, for example, because George Street is one way, they will have to turn right, uh, go down to North Champlain, go up to Monroe, and then circle back on George to, in order to access the, uh, the lower parking deck. So that was all included. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, uh, responded to the DPW's comments on traffic, uh, their questions. Uh, uh, that was outlined in an email that we received last Thursday. Uh, we responded to them. We performed the additional level of service analyses and, you know, have pretty much uh, determined that there is no traffic congestion. Pro Street, uh, uh, in front of this site, operates at level of service A, which is the best level of service during the PMP hour. Uh, traffic coming off of George Street uh, is right at the break point between level of service B and C, and that's really the, the traffic or the movements that experience the most congestion here is, is exiting George Street uh, during the peak hour. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, parking, uh, I guess you, you have some stacking uh, potential for parking if need be in the lower deck where we can stack park uh, cars if necessary. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, uh, they are requesting a 50% uh, waiver on the uh, George Street lofts. Uh, the most recent parking data for senior housing uh, apartments uh, would indicate that uh, the 85th percentile uh, highest parking demand for senior housing is only 0.67 spaces per unit, which for this project would equate to 14 parking spaces for the 20 proposed apartments. So your waivers is still uh, being conservative and, and actually we expect that there will be less uh, 
vehicles, less parking uh, required for the elderly senior housing. Okay. So Thank you. Uh, I may just uh, help you with this chart a little bit. So the way I look at this chart is uh, Roger can do all the calculations he wants, but I want to know if I have 30 spaces on the surface available for the city between the hours of 8 and 5. So um, what we looked at here was w along the, this line, if I have uh, 88 total spaces and I need 30, I need to find a number. Where does that number cross 58 spaces? So um, on the chart at 8 o'clock in the morning, it says 60. So that's the two I was talking about from 8 to 9. And then at 9 o'clock in the morning, my shared parking demand is only 54. Right, and it stays under 58 all the way up until I get past 7 o'clock at night. So that means, according to the shared demand analysis, that there will be 30 spaces available in that site somewhere during those hours. And it's going to be Rick's valet service job to make sure that the 30 spaces that they need for the city stay at the surface. So any car that need, that's on, on the site looking for parking that's not part of a public, I'm just driving in, I want to park, gets valeted to an empty space. Okay, so that's how I know there are 30 spaces available. Management problem to make sure they know where those cars are, the, the remaining cars. Now we also have some other data from uh, Victoria Place existing. We've got 20 years worth of data that says I've got 34 units there and I've only got 15 of them with cars. All right, so that's a, another piece of, uh, you know, real information from this site. This is not made up. This is what we're watching and what Rick's managing. We also know that this lot, uh, the 30 cars that the city's saying, we want to make sure there are 30 cars there. Well, they've got a 30 car lot there today and it's significantly underutilized. The DPW did their own study before they decided to enter into the agreement to sell it back to Rick. Do we, are, is this a good lot? Are we getting utility out of it? And the answer was no, it's underutilized. It's really significantly under parked. So we'll give it to the city, uh, Rick. We don't know where these 30 spaces, uh, you know, who's going to use them, but there's no evidence to suggest at the moment that they actually get used. Rick, can I ask you? Do you have an opinion as to why the 30 units only are using 15 parking spaces? Is it income sensitive? Is it location sensitive? I, I, What's your I opinion? I think it's on? a combination of all of the above. Is if you look at, I went on a website, I don't recall the name, but you type in your address and they give you a walkability score and they give you a bikeability score. And for the George Street loft site, we got a 99 and a 95, respectively, between walking and okay. um, biking. And so there's a gentleman that comes in the laundromat a couple times a week, and I, I started up a conversation with him, and he lives over at the McKenzie house. And I said, Bill, why do you live there? He said, location. I said, do you have a car? No, I can walk to everything. Okay. You've got the post office the marketplace, now all of a sudden you have the, the bus terminal literally across the street. Right. You can just walk everywhere and that's... Thank you. It's the location. So I'm going to um, also respond to the latest DPW comments here where they keep uh, suggesting these, these were the ones we got today. Let me... To keep going? I think what may make sense is, um, is to let DPW provide their comments and then I would give you an opportunity to reply to those. Just, yeah. it helps us hear this in the right order, I think. Good. So let me propose this. Do board members have questions on the issues we've been discussed? If not, my proposal would be to open it up to the public so people can ask questions, make comments, and then we'll have the city come up and discuss the uh, parking and traffic comments and then let the applicant come back. Does that? Any questions from board members at this time? It's not your last chance. No. Okay, good, All right. So, why don't I gonna, I wanna, since people have been sitting here for a long time, I'm going out of order a little bit. Are, are there members of the public who would like to ask questions or uh, have comments? Yes, sir.
Good evening. My name is Brian Precourt. My family owns the building across the street from the Bove's restaurant uh, on the corner of Pine and Pearl Street. It's, um, it was built in the early 1800s. It's got 13 apartments and five small offices. My concern is the parking. Um, I was concerned, um, the parking's always been a little muddled uh, to me in how this was figured out. I was concerned in 2001 when the first development was done and the 57 unit, um, there were 57 parking spaces in that municipal lot. I was assured by the city that with the new development there would be no reduction in parking. They showed me the math and I couldn't understand how a 57 uh, space municipal lot reduced to 30 spaces was not a reduction in parking, but that's what I was told. Um, I was also assured by CETO and a number of people that those 31 spaces would remain metered at a municipal parking lot. You know, I was that that was going to work and, and, and that was going to be fine. Um, everything that I've seen, th as I said, the, the parking calculations always seem to get a little muddled with me because everything that I've seen in the zoning documents, it talks about proposed 48 parking spaces. Those 30 parking, municipal parking spots were always counted into the parking calculations. And now they seem to be counted again into the parking calculations. So why have a concern with that? We have some five small offices over there, and those offices use that parking. Yes, it is convenient. It is not full all the time. That's what makes the parking lot convenient. I can pull in there. Um, two offices have, have given their notice and left because of this. Uh, Linda's so unique, uh, is concerned about the parking, and after 18 years in the building, she's going on month to month to look for another place because she's concerned about the parking. Um, the city doesn't seem to have much concern down there. I heard that a study was done and that that was an underutilized parking lot. Was that study done before the Cherry Street parking garage was torn down and the city had the bright idea to remove all the parking on the south side of Pearl Street in front of my building for a bike lane and a flower pot. My tenants don't really need the flower pot or the bike lane. They need parking. Uh, I have great concerns with what the, the, there's talk of that these spaces are going to remain 30, there's going to be 30 spaces to remain in the public, uh, for public use. But if you read the documents, they don't have to be. The post agreement, uh, uh, agreement with Boves states that the city, at its discretion, can decide that it no longer needs those 30 parking spaces and Boves gets them. There's no public comment or, or anything, it's just it can decide. What would make the city decide we really need these spaces? My understanding is the Boves are going to collect the money on it. What does the city care? Or am I supposed to believe that, well, we should really trust the city this time, and this time those 30 spaces are really going to remain public? I have a great problem with trusting the city that they're going to remain public. My building's been there for, uh, for over 150 years. We're trying to utilize, we spent a great deal of money 25 years ago renovating that building. The uses in that building does, uh, need parking, and the city seems to have very little concern for that. Those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Chair. Good evening. My name is, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Sharon Busher. I'm a city councillor from Ward 1. This obviously is not in my ward, but um, that doesn't preclude me as a resident from making comments regarding this. Um, I do want to just um, pick up on what the other gentleman said. I, I do believe there has been a fair amount of controversy uh, between um, what is necessary for parking for the businesses, et cetera, around this development. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how recent um, the DPW uh, tabulation of the spaces and how many are utilized was done. I don't know when that report was done. Um, I know it was this, the comments that were shared tonight were comments I heard maybe a year, a year and a half ago. Um, so I think it is germane to find out is that still 
the case or has it changed one way or the other? Um, I am concerned about the fact that the 30 spaces that are available, it seemed to suggest only daily though, and so I'm just trying to figure out, is that true or are they available for public 24-7? Um, I do recall that the, the DPW felt that the amount of revenue that would be collected from those spaces was not significant so that uh, Mr. Bove could have that revenue. That's my recall on that conversation also. Um, so anyways, I really would like to understand the public spaces better and make sure that we are not only welcoming a new addition, but we are also supporting those uses that are in existence right now that will continue. I think that's really important. Um, the other comment regarding parking, and I'm not sure, I couldn't understand what is germane and what isn't germane in, in this application, um, but I think the housing units, you can speak about parking, I'm not sure. Um, but now in Ward 1, we have senior housing, and Macaulay Square is one of those examples where, unfortunately, people, I think, underestimate like it or not, what seniors do and what they need for cars. And in Macaulay Square, people are clamoring. They don't have enough parking. Um, so I'm really concerned about when we make assumptions regarding what parking needs are for certain populations of people, whether those people are people who are members of inclusionary zoning who may actually have to work outside of the city and need their own vehicle. It's, it's, you know, it's not just one size fits all. And I think if we develop correctly, we should be smart about it. Um, uh, the other piece regarding parking, last comment about, about parking is that um, with the, um, the loft, there will be, I guess, 20 spaces for 20 units. It seems fine, but what about if someone has a visitor, where do they park? I've always wondered about that. How do you accommodate visitors for people? I just don't know how that is handled. Um, so moving on to the other reason why I'm here is um, I'm, it's not got to do with height, as maybe some of you might have thought. It has to do with the historic nature of some of the structures. Um, one of them, Bove's Restaurant, is on um, the historic register. My understanding is um, houses on George Street, 13 to 15, and then 19, those two lots, um, qualify but are not on the historic register. And to me, I think that, um, so this is my two cents on this. In Florida, if you go to Florida and go to a certain hotel, they actually built around uh, an old diner and used that diner as part of the restaurant. It looks like you could still have that facade and still do that, and so there'd be a link with history and yet the new use. It just seems like such a missed opportunity, um, and I don't think you, I, I think it still could happen, and I think people would like that um, anyways, but it may be a different tone for a restaurant. That's number one. Number two is for the houses, the old houses that are going to be demolished. Um, once again, I'm not sure why the facade of the houses couldn't have remained and then the new structure be built behind it as an addition with some height and you would have the streetscape as it existed with the, with the old and historic, but yet you'd incorporate behind and around the new and still not lose units. I, in this city, I always hope that there is opportunity for creativity as we move forward, but I really am mourning the lack of respect for past and history, um, and I think it's a very sad turn in this city that we don't understand the value of it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dave Hartnett, former North District City Councilor. As of last night was my Congratulations. First Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. It's great serving with the city. I'm sorry. I don't think Mr. Hartnett's been sworn in. Oh, 
I'm sorry, do you want me to raise oh, my Oh, right yes, hand? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth under pain and penalty of perjury? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mary. Great, thanks. I just want to address two issues in regards to the project that I think is, what, seven, eight years, maybe even further down. But just over the last three years of, of the work uh, that they've done through the neighborhoods, uh, the Boves and the project managers coming to MPAs. I think they've been to the board two and three MPA at least two or three times, laying this whole project out. I appreciate the effort that has been made, uh, you know, in regards to this project, work, which in an area in the city of Burlington, I think is in desperate need of some growth and, and, and it makes sense. And, and not to mention an affordable place to stay overnight that doesn't cost $275 um, really is a need for us, given the location where the medical center is right up the street, the University of Vermont. We, we priced people out from staying in Burlington. You, they don't stay here. They sit with South Burlington and they're on Shelburne Road. And so it'd be a great addition, I think. But in regards to parking, I would invite any of you guys to go downtown Monday through Friday during the day and look at the empty parking garages that we have, even, even since Cherry Street has been closed, right? There, are, there is plenty of parking in downtown Burlington. And right, and the message lately over the last four or five years is that we want people to live in our downtown. We want them to be able to walk and bike and ride the bus. And we don't want vehicles in our downtown, right? That's, that's really kind of the change that we've been trying to make here in downtown Burlington, right? And I think uh, that we've been successful in doing it. I understand that we have an obligation to supply parking for small businesses that might be across the street, but certainly not for tenants that live there, right? That's not our responsibility as a city to, to maybe possibly supply parking for, for people that are renting apartments. That's clearly on the landlord, right? And so why I, uh, I understand that the small businesses might need some parking, I, I don't think it's our responsibility if the tenants are using uh, any of that parking, you know, overnight and stuff, and now that might be gone, but that's certainly not on the city, right? They need to, the landlord needs to supply the, you know, parking or come up with an alternative parking for them, but it's not on for us. But so I just wanted to, to say that there is plenty of parking in down. It might not be across the street from where you want to go, but there's plenty of parking in downtown Burlington. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone who has not spoken who would like to speak? All right. Well, why don't, uh, does the city, DPW, you want to come up and tell us about parking? And I, as, as you're coming up, again, on the parking issue, the proposed condition, which would be become part of our permit, if approved, is that the 30 public spaces shall be provided and accommodated per the parking management plan. So that is proposed as a condition to this permit. Great, hi, thank you. Susan Molzon, Senior Public Works Engineer with DPW. Um, we did look at the submitted traffic study assessment as well as the parking assessment. Um, I can reiterate a few comments from Roger. Um, I've been working with Roger um, to resolve um, and we'll continue to work with them to resolve our other comments. Um, regarding the traffic, um, there's no significant impacts uh, to the surrounding area, um, including with the recirculating of traffic um, to access the various driveways on the site. Um, the remaining comments primarily deal with the parking and the parking management, um, again, to ensure that the 30 spaces will be available for public parking um, during the daytime. Um, um, we did have some comments um, and things we would like addressed in the assessment, um, and we'll continue to work to resolve those comments. Um, I think most of them lead to that we believe there'll be um, more cars will need to be valet parked and stacked, um, so just looking for some more details on how that will be managed um, to accommodate all the vehicles within, um, I believe the plan is in the underground parking garage. Right, so just so I so yes. this went to the applicant today. So what you're looking for is modifications to the traffic and parking study to respond to questions or provide additional information. Correct, yes. And these comments um, uh, more informally were provided um, to Roger Dickinson on Thursday and Friday of last week and then formalized today. Uh, these were the remaining comments. Um, there were a few others which uh, we had Roger had addressed. Okay. 
All right. Questions for DPW? So I haven't totally reviewed your um, memo, but to some extent, can you, so there's 128, there's a requirement of 128 parking spaces minus the 20 waiver, which is 108 spaces. Where are those other 20 spaces going away to? <laughs> I'm not understanding your question. Oh, sorry. I thought in your staff comments it says there needed to be 128, whereas the minimum requirement is 128 parking spaces. And they're asking for a 20 car waiver or a 20 space waiver, correct? So I, it's important that the board understand that one of the new provisions of the form district is when you provide underground parking, you get a bonus calculation. So for every parking space provided below grade, it counts as 1.75 spaces. Okay. And you can utilize that count towards your parking requirements. So although there may be hard spaces, originally um, there were 48 underground and John said you were able to capture an additional space after that and 39 at grade. So although there's 124, does that sound, it counts up to 124. The, the short answer is they can meet their requirement for the hotel calculation, which is 70 spaces. They can meet the 20 spaces for the lofts development given a 50% uh, waiver um, at the discretion of the DRB. And they can meet the 18 spaces that were previously approved for Victoria Place. It is important to understand, too, that when Victoria Place was permitted 20 years ago, they were given a 65% parking waiver. And as the applicant and the owner have given testimony, they've never required that many parking spaces that were they were required to provide those 18 spaces. Thank you. I'm not certain if that answered your question, but I think you need it to does. see the I bigger picture. I think I was picture. wondering about the physical versus on paper. Yeah, exactly. That clarifies, yeah. I had a question uh, regarding paragraph three of the memo that you provided. Want to use, use the microphone a little closer. Regarding paragraph three of the memo that you provided, the parking demand ratio using the study for the hotel, 62 spaces per room, that part I'm assuming comes from Mr. Dickinson's uh, study and also ITE, uh, parking generation manual for business hotel. The parking ratio from table 8.1, 8.1 of city's comprehensive development or ordinance, 75 spaces per room, should be used for establishing the parking supply for the hotel component of the project. So other than what is stipulated in section 8.1, is there other rationale uh, for uh, recommending this? Um, yes, well, for recommending using the city's ordinance um, rather than the ITE parking generation, um, that number from the ITE manual uh, may not be as relevant to this location. Um, I believe that number um, the ITE gives several different numbers depending on the location, the types of hotels. Um, and so that was based on one study, um, and I believe it was a s suburban location. Um, so we feel that the sticking with the city's ordinance of the 0.75 spaces per room um, is more accurate. Um, I believe that number was used in the parking assessment submitted by Scott and Partners, is that correct? Yeah. Um, I believe it is just needed to be updated in the shared parking calculations. But. Thanks. Yeah. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, I just had, sorry, one more question. Just uh, the, the analysis and maybe you're not the best person to answer this, of the parking lot use um, being essentially underutilized right now. Was that done before or after the Cherry Street garage came down? That I don't know. Okay. Back. We do have someone here from CETO who can respond to that question, Allie. Thanks, yeah, it was, I think a couple of people brought it up, so mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure we address that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Susan. All right. Maybe why don't we hear on on that specific issue if you if you can. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. On that particular issue, 
that work, so did Jillian Nant and CEDO, Assistant Director CEDO, that work was actually done uh, in 2016. Uh, between the March 10th and the 31st of July 2016, DPW had in fact conducted 45 counts of this lot. And of those counts, the lot had between 86 and 100% occupancy only twice, and between 51 and 85% occupancy four times. And in the remainder 39 counts, the lot was below 50 occupancy. So 50% occupancy. So all of this to say that the lot has been greatly uh, underutilized. In fact, it was one of the overriding considerations which led the city uh, to move uh, in that uh, direction. All right, but I think the time period you just mentioned, the, the Cherry Street garage was available during that period of time. So with that no longer there, is there additional demand um, yeah, and, that's and a, these spaces need to be available for sure. that. Sure, and I think that that's a good question, but I think from all the information um, and feedback that we have, that lot still remains uh, greatly underutilized. Um, I wanted to make a couple of other observations, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and one of the things I wanted to remind, and again, it goes in the direction of the underutilized nature of this particular site, and we would recall that this site, 70 Pearl Street, was actually called out uh, in Plan BTV Duncan and Waterfront as an underutilized uh, site. And we understand underutilized sites in Burlington downtowns means you have um, a shortage or inadequate density and uh, underrepresentation in terms of uh, what one can use the lot for, i.e. residential purposes. And so all of this to say that CEDO supports uh, this particular uh, proposed mixed-use commercial and residential uh, project. We believe that it will reinforce the developing urban edge along Pearl Street and provide, when we heard about their housing units, it in fact increases the number of housing units. Uh, initially, uh, I think it was six, and now an additional 14 of senior uh, housing. Um, I think that that's a good thing, five of which would be low to moderate uh, income uh, units. Much has been said of the uh, 39 uh, unit uh, hotel, estimated to generate 30 new jobs. We believe too, and we know this to be the case, that we will see an increase in gross revenues for the city through the restaurant uh, and the hotel. We have talked quite a bit uh, of the uh, parking, and um, we are prepared to work with our uh, sister department, the CEDO, and the applicant to refine and to uh, uh, respond to whatever additional concerns uh, the uh, department uh, may have. The other thing, uh, before I close, I want to uh, mention to where the site uh, is located, where the project is going to be located. We know, of course, that there is access to a myriad of other transportation options, not the least of which is the transit center. Others have talked about the biking, um, the car sharing, the pedestrian uh, access, all big pluses for uh, the uh, project. Um, my final uh, observations relate to the environmental friendly, um, friendly aspects uh, of the project, the solar, solar panels which will be used and the lead for, um, which will be pursued in the design, construction, and operation of the hotel portion. And finally, on historic preservation, um, I know that the Bove's Cafe is very near and dear uh, to many uh, people. Um, I think we feel uh, persuaded that the design and facade treatment, which would be uh, used, um, will in fact uh, maintain the spirit of Bove's um, Cafe and will keep um, that spirit alive and well. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you one question? Um, <laughs> I was just thinking, Bove's, just to give the memory, it'd be nice if the hotel could permanently smell like garlic, but that's not my question. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, the BTV, Plan BTV, you mentioned that it's recognized as an underutilized parking lot. And just to be consistent, because we asked about this with the parking analysis, when, when was that claim made? Was it 
you know, prior to Cherry Street Garage coming um, down? When was Plan BTV done? I think this was a few years ago, about four, okay. absolutely within the last uh, four years. So several underutilized sites were called out there. This was one of them. Yeah, I okay. think that was in about 2016. Yeah, uh, no, City Council just approved the, the Oh, redo. that's the comprehensive. That's the comprehensive. comprehensive. That was an update of the okay. comprehensive uh, development plan. This one was specific From to the downtown region. and the waterfront. So okay. two different things. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, sure. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so does the applicant want to respond to the questions I heard uh, sort of centered on parking, sufficiency of parking, the available of the par public spaces, and again, there was a question about uh, preserving the historic buildings, both the Bove's restaurant and the two houses on George Street. Sure. Um, I'll take the parking first since it's... <laughs> fresh in our minds. Um, the, uh, I, I, we, we kind of respectfully don't agree with the DPW analysis that we should be using the city uh, um, percentages because uh, the whole point of this is that we're, we're providing shared parking in an arrangement that is generally, as uh, Mr. Hardner pointed out, um, following um, a mindset that says we're trying to get rid of cars. We don't expect people to show up with cars, park in the city, and then um, you know leave them there all day, pay for them, and uh, so on. We're expecting uh, customers of the hotel to show up by taxi or by bike or by sailboat or what have you, and and we don't expect them to have the kind of cars that you would uh, normally expect in a suburban hotel. You know when I go to a suburban hotel, I drive there, and then I'm wondering where I'm supposed to go now. I have to get back in my car. If I go to a city hotel, usually I try and find one that I don't need a car for at all. And I'll take some other transportation from the airport or for however I'm getting here. And that's why these uh, sites are attractive. So we really are expecting uh, both the residential population and the hotel population to, to not have cars at all in this equation. In fact, we would be really happy if there weren't any cars parked in the lot at all and the city can have as many as they want for as long as they want, but we, we know that won't happen. Um, there may be uh, you know um, special occasions throughout the year where high demand on the hotel and other uh, reasons why people are parked there and Rick will have to find a way to uh, still satisfy his uh, agreement with the city, and that's going to be his challenge. But uh, the parking analysis, using uh, the the numbers that Roger has uh, gone out and found, uh, that are applicable in a wide range of applications, but specifically exactly for this kind of thing, show that this is going to work. And we would like to rely on that mindset and on those numbers, and and go from there. Um, and if Roger has anything else to add about trends in uh, parking counts and percentages? Probably now is the time. Do you want to? Let, let me just throw something out there. Is yeah. again, is the the city DPW has requested additional information, has raised issues that you're responding to now. Um, it, would the applicant want? additional time either to discuss these open issues with the city or an opportunity to review them more carefully and reply in writing. I'm trying to, yeah. I'm, I'm well, anticipating that we will not close the hearing and deliberate tonight, although the board will discuss this, um, and that we would set it for a hearing at which time we could hear a report back on what you've been able to work out with the city on parking. Is that I, I'm not sure how to answer that. I'll let, I'll let Rick finish the answer, but I'm going to start by saying, you know, there's a, there's a, there appears to be a fundamental disagreement about how to address parking and parking counts. And we're trying to say uh, that we should be using the models that are out there that, that are specifically uh, for a shared use situation. It's what the city's trying to do with the site in general. It's what all of us are trying to do as, as uh, you know, city, um, you know, people who either live here or visit here, none of us want a, a park 
you know, lots of empty parking left around. We're only trying to build what's reasonable and what's acceptable. On paper, I have way more spaces than I'm supposed to have. I have 124 spaces on paper. I don't know how to use them. Nobody's really given us a shot at what happens with those spaces that are built into your regulations as bonuses for doing what we're doing, which is putting spaces underground. I heard DBW say that they were anxious or willing to continue to discuss this with the applicant. And, That's and, I'm and trying to a, pick up on yes, that. Is that condition, something you want to do or? I, I want to I just ask you one question. It's already a condition in the staff report for uh, this project. So uh, I feel like we walk away from this, we're left to you know, uh, work on this with DPW and make them happy. And uh, I'm just, I would like to get some indication that the direction that we're going in, which appears to satisfy most, if not all of the criteria that are in your regulations and, and that this project is designed to achieve is the right direction. Otherwise, you know, just you know what I'm, Ultimately, that is this board's call on whether the parking is sufficient. So again, you, I'm not saying you have to agree with DPW yeah. um, or you have to give them everything they're looking for. The question is whether you can work something out, get a little closer, um, which frankly makes our job a little easier. But in the end, if you continue to have these disagreements, then it comes back to this board to decide which one we think is appropriate. And I think we've heard both sides. <laughs> I, I think I, 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 explain this to me again. So, you there is there a motion and a thing that happens tonight that says go and uh, as as staff is. I, I think we will discuss that in a second. We can do that right now. And and this is just me, one of five people speaking. I think because there's a lot here, we need to think about what we've heard. I have not gotten through the hundreds of pages of materials that are in the packet. I would need to absorb that and think about it. I, I'm, my request would be that we continue it to the earliest available next date, at which point we can come back and ask additional questions we might have and you and the city might be able to present some consensus that you've reached on this or we can't reach consensus board, it's up to you. That's my thought. Does it, let me throw that out to the board. Is there somebody who wants to close the public hearing and deliberate? tonight or Monday or continuing it? Does that make sense? I, if I'm the only one who thinks that, then I'm one of five. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think I'm known for not being a huge fan of putting in too much parking because it is a waste. Um, but I do think that there is some concerns. I think some of those could be easily addressed. For example, the public parking, can there be more signage? Can you put something in your parking plan that does more of an indication of how the hotel will actually manage that actively, you know, like how will they make sure that the keys are actually valeted and so on, that I think would address probably a lot of our concerns. So to give you time to do some of those things would be. Okay. I didn't know I was even coming to this hearing until <laughs> an hour or two ago. So, I, so I'll, I don't want to deliberate tonight. I'm okay, <laughs> good, thank you. <laughs> good, all right, so I think that's, I um, Scott and Mary, when's our next available date? So the. The, well, there's a catch to it. The next available date is April 16, and it's actually a light agenda. This could be added, but Mary and I, as project managers, are at a conference, so you'd have to do it without us, uh, or you could defer till May 7. Do you have a preference in terms of how much time? I, I know, like <clears throat> most applicants, you want to build this summer as soon as, as, soon as possible. I, I think on this, on the outstanding issues, frankly, I. I personally would be willing to stumble through this even without Mary and Scott because it's uh, we have good experts uh, that we can ask questions of. I, I agree with that. There's a lot of information and documentation that we have to review, not just parking, but a litany of other items too. Uh, and as long as it's okay with the applicant and DPW that um, many of the uh, parts of this memo can be addressed and possibly potentially resolved, uh, I, would, I would recommend moving this to the 16th as, okay. as with you, Austin. Would you feel comfortable without Mary and Scott, but uh, with DPW and? I, yeah, I think I would ask Roger and Susan to return on the 16th. So if we have questions, the people that 
have the expertise that are available to uh, to answer those questions. With that, I, again, I prefer to have Scott and Mary here, but rather than delay it for another month, I, I'd press on. I think I heard somebody say it, that would be okay. We're, we're kind of in your hands anyway, so. Uh, you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not kind of. Um, all right, so let's use that as a working premise. Uh, would you like me to address the historic elements now? My, my own narrative on the project explained in detail many of the considerations that were uh, made on behalf of the historic items. We've been working on this project for a long time. We've met with the State uh, Historic Preservation Office. We've met with the city. We've reviewed what happens to these buildings and how significant they are. There is 150 page uh, archaeological and historic assessment report in your package, which I'm sure you haven't read yet. Um, that explains in, again, in great detail the history of each one of those structures, um, what condition it's in now, what physical fabric is left of the original. And, 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 and right? we have looked at that in the context of past applications. Yeah. And so, again, I think we have, we have some new board members, but yeah. I think there is a lot of background on the history of those buildings. So. Um, so significant mitigation measures have been uh, put in place, the, not the least of which Rick was hoping I would show a video tonight, uh, which I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> but it, um, one of the items that would be put on the side of the building is another byway panel, similar to the one out in front on Pearl Street by the post office, that explains the whole Little Italy part of the city, which is a big deal. And there's, only, there's not, you know, it's gone, it's not there. This restaurant has been the last remaining link, and his family has been the last remaining link to that entire neighborhood. And so it will be memorialized on a byway panel, which will include a scannable link to the video. Four minute trailer is available <laughs> now. It's being done by uh, somebody in Boston who just happened to hear about the, the restaurant closing, came up with this camera and spent the last couple of days of the restaurant's open existence filming. And so that will be linkable through a smartphone or what have you. Um, and on the side of the building, the, the whole building design is designed with the memory of that restaurant in, in mind. Um, so, uh, and the, the, the buildings on George Street, frankly, in my it continues to be my opinion. They're in the RH district. They're too close to Pearl Street. They're, they're much smaller than they should be according to your own regulations. And as you imagine the density and the transition from uh, the re residential neighborhood RH, um, and you read what that RH district is for, this project delivers that. And those two structures have been altered immeasurably since they were originally built. Sure. One of them. I had a question about the historic. Yeah, let me just building. go ahead, Rick, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Thir Sounds good. 13 George Street had a fire approximately five, six years ago in July. There's nothing left of, of original at that site. So it, it may be um, on the list of potential, but there's, there's nothing there. It's sited and. Um, We've done the studies. I guess I just need to ask this question in, in respect. When the board has the city planners spending countless hours creating 15, 25 pages of findings in regards to this project and then passes it along to the board for their perusal, I guess I get lost here is, wouldn't the board defer to the experts who have spent these countless hours and, and time looking through every, all the minutia? Isn't that their is, role? Is your, your specific question is, do we, will we defer? I think well, we will 
carefully look at the information that staff has provided as well as you. Uh, we respect their judgments and we have their recommendations and conditions in front of us, but ultimately it's up to us. And I think to maybe answer your broader question, it's that this is a public process. And so this gives opportunity for public input and for us to consider that public input beyond what staff find. Yeah, and staff's hearing things tonight that they're maybe hearing for the first time. So that has to go into it. I, I worry when I, I hear the, the, the concerns about parking, right? And we have our agreement with the city and it spells out what has been testified to earlier tonight. But then I, um, one of the board members said that we might have other questions. Do you have an idea of, of, of where those questions might be so that we can be prepared well, I mean, the next time? One of them was time? about historic structures. Um, so regarding that, um, just to clarify, my understanding is that uh, proper documentation of the historic structures will occur during demolition. Is that correct? Of course. Pri prior to demolition. Prior to prior. demolition. So then, and then you already stated that you're working with the SHPO uh, on this. So with documentation, um, is that document that documentation is going to be provided prior to any zoning permit being filed with the, with the city? Um, I'm not sure how it's spelled out, but our commitment is to make sure those buildings are documented as required by the city prior to, to demolition. So um, if the certificate for work has to be done. We've had all the experts that. looking at these three buildings from the state to UVM. You got to remember, we've been working on this for six and a half years. I, I completely and, understand. And it's we a have, lot of hard work. We have not rushed. I completely understand. We have not rushed into anything. Yeah. We have done things over and over again. Sure. Yeah. And and so whatever the the ordinance or the law states, we will do it to that degree. No shortcuts. So if we need to do ABC, we're going to do ABC, whatever it is. There, we're going to do it the right way. The two buildings on George Street, I don't really care about. Obviously, I care about the restaurant. But we had to talk with my dad before he passed away. He was okay with that. We've done, we just, I don't know why this gentleman showed up at the restaurant in October, two months before we closed. And he happened to be a, a, a document, doc, he made documentaries from Boston. He just showed up, just was in Burlington, talked to a hotel concierge, they directed him to the restaurant. He, the reason it, he hasn't finished the documentary is because he can't take money from us because there's a conflict of interest. So he's been working on this for the past three years now to finish it. We have a great trailer. Of course, you're not going to be able to see it tonight, but we have a great trailer. It just gives you, this is not something that we have entered into lately. This is, this is more than just a building. This was our life for, for generations and so if the, the point of this is that we are going to do everything exactly the right way no ifs ands we're going to do it exactly the way that it needs to be so if if we need to do this before zoning we're going to do it, it we just are we're going to do it thank you and just to <clears throat> reiterate i think we all appreciate the work that staff does and we more than anything appreciate your family and the legacy of boves and as a fellow italian um i miss it dearly and i know it wasn't easy to close it so just know that we really feel um great gratitude to staff and the work and also your family and the countless italians that made burlington great <laughs> and we're excited to see the final product with the bulletins and the video. And I really appreciate the facade, um, the Art Deco. That's re a really nice touch, a big change from the sketch. So thanks for incorporating that. Good. All right. So Could I just add a small supplement since the topic was um, historic review? Um, some of you may remember when this came to us as sketch plan more than six years ago. And at that time, the corner building, the standard house, was included in that redevelopment. And there were strong feelings about how important that building was to Burlington. So the applicant and the owner stepped back and have taken these years to reassess. The owner has made a much 
significant, a grand uh, investment in that building. It, it looks fantastic, and I don't think it's a secret to know that they're about to get a preservation award for that building. So um, the applicant and owner are quite earnest in saying that this is important to them to do it correctly. And I, again, I remember those hearings and had very strong feelings about that standard building and, and appreciate what you've done there. Thank you. So I think where we are is, uh, while I do this in the form of a motion, I, I move that we continue the public hearing to a date certain on our regular hearing date on April 16. Yep. Marion Scott, is that the right date? Yep. Um, at which time, again, we would love to hear a report back from the applicant and or DPW on anything they've been able to work out on parking requirements. Uh, and the other issue would just be to give the board the opportunity to ask uh, questions on what we heard tonight and anything else that may come up as we finish our review of the supporting documents. All right. I, that's, that I was intended as a motion, second. although it got carried away. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a second? Zariah. Second. All right. Discussion? All those in favor? All right, so good. So we'll see you back on the 16th. Thank you all. This was very helpful. Thank you. Could Austin have said more clearly he doesn't need us? Huh? You don't need us. <laughs> That's not what I said. We really value staff, <laughs> but we I don't need you. I mean, can I have a transcript of my comments by tomorrow morning? <laughs> No, that's that's what I heard. <laughs> we just need DPW. They're the only office we need. That's well, not true. I think that's that's the last agenda item. Yes, it is. So I get to sit here and say the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>